Uh, Steve wants to talk today a, a little bit about, about uh, morality. I, I wanted to say a few things because um, um, about both morality and, and wait for meaning this afternoon. I'm one of these people who uh, I don't find the morality question that baffling, actually, <laughs> at all. And uh, when I, you know, I'm asked, how, you know, how can we possibly ground morality? My answer is, we, we've, we've been doing it. Uh, we've been doing it very well. And what the thing that re has really impressed me about morality is, uh, we're, we're actually, it is a place where philosophy has made a difference. That there is room for reason. And uh, there is a, a kind of forward movement uh, in morality. We look back in absolute horror uh, at things that our ancestors did. We look back in absolute horror even at, at, at some of the things that we did in our earlier life that we found. I've had quite a few men, some of them even in this room, say to me, you know, you know when I was a young man, I just took it for granted that women cannot do uh, math and, and physics. And, you know, I, I just... You Which know, one of you said that? <laughs> 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 That's right. N name names. Um, you know, and uh, I think that our great-grandchildren will look back at her and, and some of the things that we do. And the, one of the interesting things is that once something is, looked, is, is seen with horror, um, we never go back. Once slavery is abolished, a country never reinstitutes slavery. Uh, there was one reversal, and that's when Napoleon came in, and then he, he did, in the, in the colonies, uh, bring uh, slavery back for a very short time. But that's the only uh, reversal, a forward movement, that I can uh, see. So there is a place for, and, and, and if you actually look back, you see philosophers uh, actually making the first arguments when nobody's talking about it. And then, you know, something happens, you know, people write novels, you know, uh, um, uh, what was it, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, huge, huge effect, but, you know, it started with John Locke in the 17th century making an argument about, uh, about slavery, a very good argument, saying, look, if we're already committed to this, then on pains of inconsistency, we have to be, we have to widen our notion of uh, what creatures are t treated with, uh, with dignity. And it's, so there is a place for reason here and for, for, for moral reason, um, given the background in evolutionary psych psychology, that there is, you know, there's something going on in evolutionary psychology. The other thing I just want to say is evolutionary psychology, you know, is, is not enough. Um, I, I've been interested by the work of Jonathan Haidt. I, uh, I, I, I deplore the conclusions that he draws from it. But it's an interesting, the different kinds of morality, all of which lie, different notions of morality, different sentiments of morality, all of which lie, we can give evolutionary explanations for. Uh, yeah, do you want to say a little bit about what the yes. result was? Well, was? well, let me just, the five, you know, the five moral uh, sources of, mm -hmm. of a moral, different kinds of moral sentiments, uh, one of them is um, derived from our evolutionarily explained uh, feelings of disgust. You know, there are good reasons for disgust. I was very amused by that review of McGinn's book you sent me. Thank you very much. Uh, but we have a good evolutionary, you know, that basically our disgust is, uh, is provoked by things that are carriers of pathogens. This gets generalized. We derive notions of uh, uh, bodily purity from it. I was brought up to moralize certain foods, you know, that I had a moral revulsion when I, I remember I went to the supermarket and I saw pure unadulterated lard, a hunk of lard, and it was a moral revulsion, you know, that it was, it was so impure. Um, I've been talked out of that. Uh, there are, uh, there are um, group, uh, group what is it? loyalty uh, that people feel that a lot of moral sentiments come from that. Again, we can explain that. A lot of very uh, things that, one, that we can judge quite immoral come from that. Xenophobia, we're really trained to deal with about 150,000 people, feel close to 150,000 people tops. That's the size of a tribe. 
150. 150. Did I say 150,000? 150. Yes, 150. That's why Dan mentioned the thing about girls not doing math. <laughs> um, what else? Um, uh, authority, you know, uh, following authority, um, equality and harm. Some of these things we can actually rationalize, uh, I would say, so that, you know, uh, harm to others. Fairness. There are arguments for this. Uh, the other ones, there's no way to really argue them. And, and, and the right, purity, authority, and, and loyalty. You can't argue yeah. them, right? And so, you know, and Why they crumbled. They think those are moral values. Well, they do for good evolutionary explanation, but, you know, once. The, the truth is, moral psychology without moral philosophy is insufficient. And so, you know, moral psychology will give you these five. And you need moral philosophy to come in and say, look, and some of them are bogus, and some of them can be, um, can be justified. So that's, that's my little spiel about morality. And I think that, uh, in fact, the law, uh, the second law, gives us, um, since it gives us everything, all sorts of uh, asymmetry, it actually gives us, in a way, uh, morale. It gives us mattering. Because uh, one thing that everybody knows, and all behavior is predicated on, is that I matter. Um, and you know, I'm strategizing for my future. That's what uh, you know, some of the strategies work, and some of them don't. And when they work, my genes get, get passed on. Um, but uh, I am convinced, and I don't need any argument, it's just a given, uh, you know, that I matter. And that's a place where moral reasoning can, can latch on and expand, uh, say, lo, if you matter, or, you know, either you're cosmically unique in this universe, or uh, there are some other creatures that matter as well, and you can, you can get going, and that's how we've been doing it. Um, so that's my, my spiel. So, Steve. Well, uh, I agree with Rebecca that uh, you can usefully uh, reason about morality, um, and we do. Uh, but I think there's a narrower question, which is what um, impelled me to volunteer to say a few things, which is whether we can ground morality through science or any rational process. That is, if you uh, ask about moral postulates, uh, principles from which you can derive all your other moral judgments. Um, is it possible to find such moral postulates by reasoning from things outside morality, like science or the theory of evolution or whatever? Um, I'm Im impelled to raise this question by being thoroughly annoyed by Sam Harris's book, in which he claims science can provide a basis for moral postulates. I don't believe it. Uh, there's a long, honorable tradition of people who've denied this. Uh, I think David Hume is the obvious example. And I don't think I have to argue the case, because the burden of proof is surely on the other side. Um, those who think you can um, ground moral postulates in science or any other rational pro thought <clears throat> processes, I, I think have the burden of proof to, to do it, and I don't think anyone has ever successfully done so. I don't think Rebecca attempted to in the piece that I read um, on the plane coming here. Uh, she showed how you can evoke moral feelings by saying, well, I care about myself, so shouldn't I care about other people? But it, you know, one possible answer is no. And uh, there's no rational process that excludes that, it seems to me. Um, on the other hand, as I said, I think there is room for reason in this area. Um, because you might think that whether or not you can ground them in science or something like science that you actually have moral postulates and you could try to figure out what they are. 
you can go beyond that and say, well, perhaps we all agree on our moral postulates. And then it really isn't important whether we can ground them in uh, science. I mean, if everyone except crazy people and psychopaths have the same moral postulates, then that would be wonderful to find out. Even if you didn't know where they came from, you could say, well, that should be the basis of our system of justice, our, our laws, and our economic system, and so on. That would be great. What I want to argue is that that doesn't work either. Um, that not only can you not um, ground moral postulates in science, but in fact, even people who you would normally think of as behaving in a moral fashion, um, people who are guided by a, a moral sense, nice people, and for example, me, uh, do not in fact have a coherent set of moral postulates and don't really need them. Um, now, there are, let me take a few examples of this. I, in high school, I was very pleased with myself for having decided that uh, the fundamental principle that governs our actions should be the greatest happiness for the greatest number. I didn't know that other people had gotten there ahead of me. And I was very chagrined to discover that people like Mill and Bentham had said something like this. But it still seemed to me almost self-evident that that's right. Uh, well, I don't think, in fact, uh, that is the way I, and I'm, I'm now going publicly going through a sort of self-examination, which I think we all can do, and we can do both individually and collectively. Uh, I was disabused of this by reading a novel, uh, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. He describes a society in which everyone is happy, uh, except for one misfit. And uh, everyone is happy because they're conditioned to be. Uh, the alphas who run things are happy because uh, they're amused with sports and sex and drugs. And uh, the other people who have to do the menial work of society are, uh, have their brains before birth reduced in capacity so that they don't want to be alphas who have to think hard but they're just happy street sweeping the streets and so on. Everyone is happy. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's intended to be a ghastly world, and it is. It's a world in which you have sex without passion and entertainment without culture and happiness without justice. Um, so you realize, no, I'm not a... Um, I'm not a... Um, what is the word? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, uh, that's not my moral postulate. Um, on, now, Sam uh, Harris uh, is aware of, of this um, kind of counter argument and says, well, it's not happiness, it's human welfare. <laughs> well, as you make things vaguer and vaguer, of course, it becomes harder and harder to say that it doesn't fit your own moral feelings, but it also becomes less and less useful as a means of making moral judgments. You could take that to the extreme and say it's, um, make up some nonsense word and say that's the important thing and no one, no one could refute it, but it wouldn't be very helpful. Uh, I regard human welfare and the way Sam Harris refers to it as sort of halfway in that direction toward absolute nonsense. Um, but there are other things that people would say, well, it may be that you can't postulate what is the good, that we all, uh, there are competing things which are all good, like happiness and truth, for example. Um, we sacrifice some happiness when we accept the truth that we're not going to have life after death. Should we tell other people that they're not going to live after they die, it probably will reduce their happiness. On the other hand, truth has a value of its own. How do you balance truth and happiness? There isn't any algorithm for balancing that. I think you just have to accept that there's no postulate which allows you 
to judge how much happiness you're willing to give up for so much truth. Even people who accept all this will say, all right, we're, we're not going to agree on what is the good, but at least we can agree on the fundamental principle of morality that something like Rawls' original condition, that we should not treat other people worse than we treat ourselves. Rebecca was saying something like this, um, that everyone equally deserves um, whatever is good, happiness or whatever it is. Uh, that's not the way I feel either. And I think it's probably not the way most of you feel if you think about it, because uh, I could probably increase the total amount of happiness by um, making my family live on rice and beans and live in a one-room apartment uh, and um, just barely keep enough money to keep us alive and healthy and send all the rest of the money to poor parts of the world where it would do a lot more good than it does to me. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do, and I, well, I'm not confessing immorality. I'm saying that my moral feelings tell me I should be loyal to my family. Similarly, when my university tries to recruit a bright young star in physics, I, I suppose I could calculate, well, he would really do more good for some other university. And the, the greater good would imply we shouldn't go after him, let some other university go after him. I don't care. I, I care about my university. I'm loyal to my university. Similarly, I'm, I... So there, loyalty is a value. It's not an absolute value. I wouldn't, I wouldn't cause, like Edward III, I wouldn't cause the Hundred Years' War in order to advance the interests of my family. But it's one of these things that, where we have no algorithm for balancing loyalty against distributive justice. And uh, I think we have to live with that. I think we have to live with the fact that although we can reason and try to uncover what our moral feelings are, and if we get into that, I think a very good example would be arguing about abortion. Um, maybe I'll come back to that in the discussion. Uh, we, can, we can reason. The reasoning uncovers how we feel morally uh, and perhaps allows us to identify areas of agreement so that we can cooperate with each other in bringing about what we want. I think in the end we have to live with uh, not having a moral philosophy that really works in a decisive way. Um, I think we have to live the unexamined life. Um, I think this is part of the tragedy of the human condition, just like um, we have no absolute way of determining that Mozart is better than Led Zeppelin. We feel it, but uh, it's not something that we can, we can argue, we can rationally show. Uh, we have to live with the fact that, this came up yesterday, that when we discover the fundamental laws of physics from which everything in some sense, all other principles follow, we won't know why they're true. Uh, it, this is something that we have to accept, that the position of human beings is tragic, and part of the tragedy is that there is no way of um, deciding moral issues on, on the basis of, well, there is no way of deciding moral postulates which should govern our actions, and in fact, I don't think we have moral postulates which govern our actions, even when we behave morally. <laughs>